Yeah, last week we have celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, Sachin has explained its implications from a relational perspective. And uh, I would like to bring before you uh, the implications of the resurrection of Jesus uh, from a theological perspective to you. Uh, in all the churches from now till uh, the Pentecost, which is the 50th day after uh, the Passover, which is the Good Friday, uh, would be celebrated. Uh, I mean, would, during this season, uh, everybody uh, commemorate and remember, talk about uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because Jesus was uh, on earth for 40 days after his resurrection. And he appeared to so many people. And uh, we all know the narratives the, the, the Gospels give about uh, the encounters the disciples have with the risen uh, Jesus Christ. So all the churches meditate about the resurrection of Jesus from here till uh, uh, the day of Pentecost. So uh, for a few, few days, uh, let us... Let us uh, keep the great news of resurrection in our minds and celebrate and so that uh, we may be able to, uh, as we meditate, we may be able to find the depths of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and may be able to experience the real power that we can find in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, Linda, as she was leading, she said the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of uh, uh, Christian faith. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation for Christian faith. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 onwards to 14. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not raise. This is such a powerful statement from Apostle Paul, we can see the intensity uh, of this statement in the very words that Paul used. If the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, all our faith is futile. What we are believing is futile. What we are suffering for is uh, futile. And uh, uh, there is no faith, there is no hope. There is no hope if there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no hope for our resurrection. So from these words, we understand that the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of Christian faith, of everything that we are believing, all that hope that we have, it is, for, it is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hope of our resurrection. Because he rose again from the dead, we are going to raise again from the dead. That is the uh, philosophy Apostle Paul has taken. That is the kind of theology Apostle Paul does. Uh, in the last week, uh, Wednesday, we had a Bible study. We studied about the Christology of Apostle Paul, in which we discussed about the same. Apostle Paul was not talking about the resurrection of Jesus based on the scripture. Old Testament scriptures are saying in the last days that God is going to come and restore the righteous people. And he is not speaking about the resurrection of Jesus based on his religious experience or his confidence on uh, his religious behavior. And But he completely based his hope and his, uh, his belief about resurrection on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus rose again from the dead, we all are going to raise again from the dead. That is the message the early church preached. Uh, the early church preached. Even Apostle Peter preaches the same thing. 
in Acts chapter 4, they were preaching resurrection in the name of Jesus Christ, which means because Jesus rose again from the dead, you and I are going to raise again from the dead. This is a foundational belief of Christian faith. So the resurrection of Jesus is the hope of our resurrection. And Christ's resurrection is the proof of our hope. Well, how can we say you have hope? If we just simply say that I have hope and there is no reason, then people laugh at us. The very reason we have hope, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you all are very much aware of it. But uh, today I would like to bring before you one truth about the resurrection and then three implications from that. The primary truth we need to learn about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is it happened. This is the primary truth about the resurrection of Jesus. It happened. It is not any kind of myth as so many people are speaking these days. Can anyone who died raise again from the dead? It's all myth. So many around us may say that. There, and at the same time, even if you read various religious mythologies, and there are so many uh, dying and raising again gods. Dying and raising again, raising God is very common in many mythologies. Some of them you can find like Osiris in uh, Egyptian um, mythology, uh, who was killed by his own sunset and then he rose again from the dead. And then uh, Tammuz, who is the son of Nimrod, who was killed by his father Nimrod. And again, after 40 days, he rose again from the dead. You all know the tales of Tammuz. Uh, so, and Hercules. Hercules also has a resurrection story. He went into underground, which is the death for his girlfriend or his, uh, the, the, his, uh, the lady whom he loves. And he came from there. So these are, there are so many people, uh, sorry, there are so many myths which are dealing uh, with the resurrection and so many myths, so many deities claim the resurrection. But the resurrection of Jesus is completely different from these myths. Because the resurrection of Jesus is not a myth, but it is some a event or something that happened. You know, all. Uh, what is the difference uh, if you say, the answer is this. How does, how does the myth start? You know how a myth starts? Even till go, Game of Thrones. How, how myth starts? Myth starts with the words, once upon a time, long, long, long ago, okay, there was a king. Where? Once upon a time in a particular kingdom. <laughs> there are no details in the myths. Myths always say, so long ago, once upon a time, long, long ago, these kind of statements. And uh, there won't be any details in the myths. The reason I mentioned Game of Thrones also is because of this. Game of Thrones also is a myth, but this is um, an inspiration they got from Lord of the Rings, where uh, this particular author, he created a history and a culture, a language for the story. And Game of Thrones also does that. They have a history they created. They created a culture. They created religion. They created God deities for these myths. But still, these are, those are myths. And all those myths start with the words, once upon a time, so, so long ago. Only the resurrection of Jesus has the kind of details and no other myths have. And C.S. Lewis, one of the Christian authors, a great uh, well-known uh, writer, he says, those who say gospels are mythic haven't read many myths. If anybody read the myths properly, they would understand the resurrection of Jesus is not a myth at all. The details of the gospel prove that the resurrection of Jesus is not a myth, but it happened. 
we can find uh, we can find in um, book of acts acts chapter 2 verse 24 22 to 24 here apostle peter was speaking about the resurrection of jesus christ and he said men of israel hear these words jesus of nazareth a man attested by god to you by miracles i'm talking about a man he is uh, uh, he's uh, he's not someone some uh, unknown man he is someone who is known to all of you by his miracles a man attested by god to you by miracles wonders and signs which god did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know look at these words as you yourself yourselves also know you also know him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of god you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death whom god raised up having loosened the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it look at these words what apostle peter is saying i'm talking about the resurrection of the man who know very well you know him very well he is the man who comes to church every sunday and uh, wearing kurta pajama and sitting in the last row of the church him they have crucified you know him very well that is the kind of language he is using he is using a language like uh, the jesus of nazareth you know him very well uh, he always comes to second row bad and eats alpha biryani <laughs> and you know him very well and uh, he comes to saba for tea look at the kind of details he is bringing he is telling everything that they have experienced which people know about jesus these prove these uh, these details prove that jesus resurrection is not a myth but it is uh, a reality that happened and even acts chapter 10 verse 37 to 42 uh this is the word, words we have taken for scripture reading that the word you know which was proclaimed throughout all judea and began from galilee after the baptism which john preached see peter is speaking the same way of saying jesus came to second rabad had biryani in alpha hotel and came to saba and had tea okay and this message has been spread to galilee galilee first and then came to judea and jerusalem to the people who know those places very well at that very point how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for god was with him and we are witness of all things uh, which he did both in the land of jews and in jerusalem which myths have these whom they killed by hanging on a tree him god raised up uh, raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but to witness chosen before by god before by god even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose again from the dead this jesus who rose again from the dead we sat with him we had dinner with him that is the witness the apostles are bringing which clearly tells that his resurrection is something that happened it is not a myth nobody can say that and the martyrs of jesus christ prove that it is not a myth for who sake for a, for a lie who would die would you die for a lie no we don't like to even suffer for a lie and here thousands of people died for jesus christ for believing that he rose again from the dead and peter who is the disciple of jesus christ who said we have uh, we had our dinner with jesus or we had our breakfast with jesus and he chose to be crucified upside down he chose to be crucified i thought it was following he he chose to be crucified upside down than to deny what he saw hundreds of people died 
because they believed his resurrection and they proclaimed his resurrection. And for which of the deities there are any martyrs? Are there any deities for Osiris? Are there any deities, sorry, martyrs for Zeus or Apollos or for any other god? There are no martyrs for any other deities as there are martyrs for Jesus Christ. What does it tell? It tells us it happened. The resurrection of Jesus happened. So, the first truth about the resurrection of Jesus is it happened. If the resurrection of Jesus happened, what are the implications? I would like to bring before you three implications. Number one, if the resurrection of Jesus is truth, Jesus is who he said he was. If the resurrection is true, Jesus is who say, he said he was. There are so many teachers, spiritual leaders, religious leaders, gurus, but Jesus is not like any of them. But Jesus, he spoke and acted the very person of God. Jesus is not just a teacher, but he spoke the very person of God. In other words, Jesus is God in flesh. If the resurrection is true, Jesus is God himself. If the resurrection is true, the first implication is he is who he said he is. And no religious teacher can demand like Jesus. No one can demand to love him more than our families and our own lives. Unless he is of great arrogance or he is a person of the highest goodness. Jesus said, you deny your family and your own life to follow me. Can anyone ask? Can any guru ask? No one can ask that unless they are the absolute and the highest goodness. And who could claim authority over Torah except the author of Torah himself? We can read in the Bible. Um, it is said many, many, in many places it is written. Moses said so and so, but I say unto you. The law says so and so, but I tell you. These are the words of Jesus Christ. We can find repeatedly in the great, great sermon of uh, Sermon on the Mount. It was said in the old age, but I say unto you, who is someone so authoritative to uh, replace or to change something that was said in the law of God, unless he is the very author of that law. If the resurrection of Jesus is true, it tells that Jesus is God in flesh. He is the author of Torah walking in front of our eyes. And Jesus forgave sins. You know this situation very well in the Gospels. Jesus forgave the sins of a paralytic man. He said, your sins are forgiven. And the religious people around him, they got offended and said, who is he to forgive the sins of the people? Only God can do that. And for those religious people, for those religious people, forgiving the sins of others is outrageous, acting like God. Jesus acted like God. As I said previously, he spoke and acted uh, as a person of God himself. And because uh, he is God himself, he is not one among the leaders, uh, religious leaders, but he is God made flesh. That's why in Romans chapter 1 verse 4, it is written, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through the resurrection, Jesus was declared to be the son of God. 
There are two kinds of Christologies. One is called high Christology, one is, the other one is called low Christology. High Christology says Jesus was existing before his incarnation from the foundation of the world. He is co-eternal with the Father. Low Christology says Jesus was a man like you and me after his resurrection or after, after his baptism. He was appointed or anointed as the son of God. This is called low Christology. This goes along with the Christian cults. Okay. So here, when it is written, Jesus was declared to be the son of God by his resurrection. It does not mean Jesus became the son of God after his resurrection, but it means because this declaration is not unto Jesus. This declaration is unto us because we don't know him. That's why this declaration is to us. Jesus rose again from the dead. Through that, God is declaring to you and me that he is his own very son. So, the first implication of the resurrection of Jesus is, if he is who he says he is, we have to surrender our whole lives to him. Who forgave our sins? Who is the God, the God himself? It demands, if Jesus is who he says he is, it demands our complete allegiance to him. We should accept him, surrender to him. And then next implication we go. First Corinthians, in the first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, Apostle Paul writes, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Jesus, if he did not raise again from the dead, you and I are still in our sins and we are not forgiven. The same thing he also writes in Romans, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Because Jesus rose again from the dead, you and I are forgiven. His resurrection is a proof of our justification. And uh, you know how his resurrection can be the proof of our justification? I guess previously I explained, but I would like to take a moment to explain how the resurrection of Jesus can be our justification. For this uh, particular incident, I would like to take the bad language of a, a penal, co penal court kind of set up language. G many theories, they say that Jesus has taken our punishment upon himself, right? We all have committed sin and he has taken our punishment upon himself. How does it work? Just imagine with me that Jesus is the Christ and uh, we, you and I are living in the first century in Jerusalem and we crucified Jesus. You, you took the hammer and nailed him on the cross. I took the uh, spear and uh, pierced in his uh, side. You and I killed him and then and it has been recorded in the CC camera. Please don't ask me how CC camera came in the first century. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it was recorded. There were enough proofs about we murdering Jesus. And then we were brought to the court. You can say the court of God or whatever. You brought to the court and there are enough proofs to say that you have killed Jesus. What would happen? What would judge do? When there is clear CCTV footage of you and I killing Jesus, hmm? they, they have to punish us, right? They would punish us for 14 years or uh, uh, hanging on death, a capital punishment, whatever. They, he, he does punish us because the proof is very clear and evident. And imagine in the same courtroom, and the judge was about to say the verdict and said, hey, you, you killed Jesus. The proof is very clear. And you deserve to be punished for 14 years in jail. The same moment, suddenly this Jesus rose again from the dead and was walking in the courtroom. What would happen? Huh? Did we kill Jesus? Yes, yes we did. Did he, did he die? Yes, he died. Now he rose again from the dead. Because he rose again from the dead and walking in the courtroom, can the judge punish us? No. Did we kill Jesus? Yes, we did. Are we the murderers now? No, we are not. 
Why? Because Jesus rose again from the dead. We are no more murderers. That is how you and I are justified. Made, means declared to be righteous. Declared to be innocent. Because Jesus rose again from the dead. We all know that because of our sins he died. As Apostle Paul said, because of his resurrection, you and I are justified. So the second implication of the resurrection of Jesus is we are justified. And uh, uh, that is the very reason every time the resurrected Jesus appeared to his disciples. If you remember, uh, he appeared to Thomas. What is the first word he said to Thomas? Peace. And then he shows his wounded hands. Wherever he went to his disciples, he said, Shalom, peace in complete sense. These are the people who betrayed Jesus and they ran away from Jesus. They denied Jesus. And one person, he cursed other people also saying to, to say, I don't know him. Okay. And wherever he goes there and he meets those people, he said, peace. And what is the message Apostle Peter preached in Acts chapter 2? He preached, you people killed Jesus who was known to all of you by his miracles. But God rose, uh, rose him from dead. And then he says, repent and believe so that your sins may be forgiven. The resurrection of Jesus, he is not, see, is not seeking vengeance. When Jesus rose again from the dead, he did not come to Peter and say, hey, you denied me for three times. He did not tell. He did not tell any of disciples. You ran away. What kind of friend are you? He did not come to the other Jews and said, you kill me, no? let me bring, you know, the fire from the heaven. He didn't. Wherever he goes, he said, peace. That is what the resurrection of Jesus tells us. One, um, uh, yeah, so all the people who had been, who had tortured, troubled, they brought, when they sought for vengeance, the, the, but Jesus, he always sought peace. He is forgiving. And in fact, before his death itself, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the resurrection of Jesus is the proof that your sins and my sins are forgiven and you and I are justified. We are no more guilty. And uh, that is the very message of gospel. But at the same time, Jesus shows his wounded hands. What does they say? The wounded hands of Jesus, they are the sign. They teach about our spiritual and moral dysfunction. It is not, to, Jesus is not showing his uh, uh, wounds to tell you, to make you feel guilty. He's, he would like to tell you, these wounds show your spiritual, dis, moral spiritual dysfunction, but I have taken it upon myself. Peace unto you. That is the message of resurrection. So the gospel message, the resurrection, the uh, implica second implication of gospel, uh, sorry, the resurrection of Jesus is you and I are forgiven. And let's go to the third implication. Third implication of Jesus Christ. Uh, so you all know the story of Jesus' crucifixion very well. What all happened, uh, you might have heard from childhood. And Jesus was brought to the court of Pilate. What was Pilate asking, talking to Jesus? The question Pilate asked him was, are you the king? Are you the king? It's a question about uh, insurrection, right? The right word, insurrection. Uh, this is fighting against the uh, authorities of the country. Uh, so what did Jesus answer? Jesus answered in single word like, I am. I am the king. And Pilate, but he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate asked him, are you the king? He said, I am. And do you remember, then later Pilate asks the same thing to the Jews. Do you want me to punish the king of Jews or Barabbas, who is a robber? He uses the word king of Jews again. 
so the conversation with pilate and jesus christ the encounter with these two people had was about kingship of jesus christ and pilate he handed him to the roman soldiers to be crucified i don't know whether he did uh, out of the pressure or uh, what uh, to show his roman pride we do i don't understand completely it scripture is also not very clear about these things and he crucified jesus and after crucifying jesus there is an interesting thing he did that is he put a board on the cross of jesus which is inri uh, kindly forgive me for my pronunciation jesus jesus nazarenus rex luderum okay which means jesus nazareth king of jews pilate put this board on the cross of jesus christ which tells very clearly that he is mocking jesus and uh, an interesting conversation happened in the bible we can find it in john chapter 20 verse 19 onwards now pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was jesus of nazareth the king of the jews then many of the jews read this title and for the place where jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in hebrew greek and latin so pilate wants that this board should be read by everyone everybody not only jews not only greeks even latin speaking people in fact for if you speak he wants the entire world to read this board that's why he put the board in three languages and uh, so therefore the chief priests and the jews said to pilate do not write the king of the jews but write he said i am the king of the jews they asked him don't write he king of the jews but write he claimed that he is the king of the jews but what did pilate do pilate answered what i have written i have written he did not listen to them so pilate he wanted to humiliate jesus and he put the board jesus i mean king of jews jesus nazareth king of jews because uh, and through resurrection jesus proved who is the real king he broke the seal of roman authority when he rose again from the dead they put a seal on his tomb and jesus broke the seal who can break the seal of caesar breaking the seal of caesar is offensive and uh, that deserves death he broke the seal of caesar and proved that caesar has no authority over him and he is the lord because jesus is the king of jews he is the king of the world in doing this pilate actually wanted to humiliate jesus but in turn he became the first evangelist to say jesus is the king of the jews peter did not say jesus is the king of the jews till then paul did not say jesus is the king of the jews but pilate even before the death of jesus himself he put the board and declared to the entire world that's why he wrote hebrew greek and latin and said jesus king of jews he might have done it uh, to humiliate or to make joke but in return he became a living joke jesus rose again from the dead and proved who is the king that is why apostle paul uh, so what happened apostle paul emphasizes uh apostle paul emphasizes in his writings and everywhere he uses this word jesus jesus curios which means jesus the lord lord jesus christ christ jesus no others use this much paul he always uses the word lord jesus or jesus christ christ jesus christ means messiah lord means the lord caesar is not the lord but jesus is the lord and i said previously also luke starts his gospel calling caesar augustus was the lord and he ends book of acts where paul preaches jesus is the lord in the rome so who is the real lord jesus himself is the real lord if jesus himself is the real lord and uh, and it was proved to us through his resurrection what should we do 
we should obey what our lord says and what did our lord say in acts chapter 10 verse 42 it is written and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he who was ordained by god to be judge of the living and the dead so jesus is our lord and our mission is now is to share this message jesus is the lord he is the king and we ought to share our message with that the third implication we we have that is if jesus rose again from the dead he tells that jesus is our king and our mission ought to be sharing this very news that's the very reason if you read if you read so if you watched our service opener did you watch our service opener what does it end with the good news meant to be shared so our mission as a church and as individuals is to share the good news of jesus resurrection share the good news of the new king we have in the world and who you are the people may be the ruling in this world who in the lineage of pilate or caesar but we have a new king that is jesus christ which he, which was proved by his resurrection and our mission is to share about this good news so in conclusion the resurrection of jesus tells he he is who he says he is that he is he is god in flesh the resurrection of jesus tells jesus is who he says he is and we must surrender our whole lives to him i don't know if it is grammatically wrong right or wrong but i am wanted to emphasize our whole life completely we have to surrender unto himself and the resurrection of jesus demands it from us because jesus rose again from the dead we are forgiven we are in peace with god we don't need to be worried about any of our sins that we have committed or, or doing or we have we may commit jesus has forgiven us completely and because jesus is rose again from the dead he proved that he is the king and he shows our mission our mission ought to be sharing this very good news thank you